Hello and welcome to episode 51 of Talking Asperger's with Andrew. My name's Andrew Marsh and I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome seven years ago when I was 51, having had a previous career without knowing I had Asperger's as a geologist for 23 years, although I've always known I was different. In my earliest memories of growing up with family have been different and not fitting in. And I want to talk to you today about something that I have covered before in the context of employment, and that is a very important part of, of my Seven Steps program, and that's something called the safe space. I'll briefly touch on it in employment and then go on to a broader in, in a little while. But essentially what I'm talking about with the safe space is as an employer, people with Asperger's syndrome and autism can get to the point of overwhelm where they will then not be in control of what's happening. There could be a, a loud vocal outburst. It could even potentially get violent because they've got nowhere to calm down and relax because there's too much. Their, their triggers, and we have triggers, their triggers have been triggered. Bad use of language there, but you know what I mean. Their, their sensitivities have been activated. Um, and those typically can be noise, light, smells, and sudden change all of which can happen in a work environment. And the problem is that when that happens and you've had two or three of these things happen and there's been too much noise or the boss is making a change and then another change, they have nowhere for, <clears throat> no outlet for them to release their tension and their angst and their frustration. And that's when they have a meltdown. So the safe space is somewhere where an employer caters for people who need to get away from it all for five or 10 minutes, have a cup of tea, go and sit somewhere quiet where they can just be and be relaxed and calm down, take some deep breaths, refocus, and then come back to work when they're fine. So in an employment situation, the safe space could be a breakout room, providing it's not too well lit. It's not bright lights coming in. It's got sunlight coming in from the windows or it's overhead lighting. And it's not noisy because some breakout rooms, they have a television on in the, in, in, on one wall where people can, can watch. Those can be triggers as well. So the, the, the safe space needs to be somewhere quiet, really quiet, low lighting. It doesn't have to be anything too formal. If you can, if, if an employer can have a safe space that is soft cushions, soft lighting, colors, um, and the light, ideal, perfect. And and I think more employers are starting to do this. But if you if you're a smaller employer and you and you think, oh, I'm not sure how I can do this. Well, maybe there's an archive room you've got where there's a small table and a chair where the person can sit and be calm and be quiet, or somewhere in the in the back of admin, but. It may be that noise is one of their triggers and people typing on keyboards can be one of their triggers. So find somewhere that's quiet or maybe just allow them to go for a walk around the block for 10 minutes without making a fuss, without making a hullabaloo, because the last thing, the absolute last thing the person on the spectrum needs when they feel that, that they're becoming overwhelmed and they can sense that something's going to happen is to ask permission. Excuse me, I need to go. Because it could be that the very person that they're asking permission from is the person that's caused them to get into a situation where they can have a meltdown. Their boss, a work colleague, someone having a loud conversation near them. You have to have an element of trust about this, and I'm going to cover that now. It needs to be trustworthy. So if the person needs to go to their safe space, let them go. Have an agreed signal beforehand so that in, a, in an office situation, it can, be, it can be very straightforward. Put their hole punch or their stapler in the middle of their desk that says, I've gone to my safe space. So when the boss comes out and has a look, sees the, sees the stapler or the hole punch there, right, I know Andrew's gone to the safe space. In the event of an emergency, an emergency evacuation, a fire, a fire alarm, fire drill, I know where to find him if he doesn't make it to the uh, muster point. Oh, and I know where to send the rescue services in that in that instance. So you've got your health and safety covered and you know and the person knows what to do. Leave them be. Don't chase them up. Don't sit there clock watching. He's been at his safe space for 12 minutes now. I'm going to have a word with him when he comes back. Don't do any of that. Don't do any of that. 
if you see them come back from the safe space, just say, hi, everything OK? You all right now? Or, or don't even say anything. They really might not be wanting to have a conversation with anyone, least of all their boss. So allow them to get back to work, back to their situation, and they can resume work. You might be saying to me, oh, yes, but this is time. This is time from work. You're quite right. But you accommodate people who smoke. They go outside the building or they've got a smoking room or smoking area where they go. Do you clock watch those people? No, you you come to an arrangement. You have an agreement that if they go for three or four smoking breaks for 10 or 15 minutes each, that's nearly an hour they need to make up on their time. And they need to do that. And you need to have a procedure in place for doing that without clock watching. It's exactly the same for someone with Asperger's needing to get away from a situation so that they don't have a meltdown. Trust them. They're doing it for their health, for the benefit of their health. And they are doing it so that there isn't an incident in the workplace that could cause an absolute ruckus. With, with, with them. Someone having a meltdown is not something pleasant to watch. It's not pleasant to have. I've had them. It's not pleasant to watch. And you cannot rationalize with someone who's having a meltdown. Telling someone who's having a meltdown to calm down, sit down and get on with it isn't going to work. Trust me on this. It is not going to work. They are going to flail out. They're going to shout. They're going to swear. They are not in control of what is happening when they're in meltdown mode. It's a completely uncontrolled response to an overwhelming stimulus or trigger. Allow them to go to their safe space before that happens and calm down. Take 10 or 15 minutes, whatever they need, whatever they need, and allow them to calm down, come back to work, be productive. To trust them to make up the time. If you think that there is an issue with their making up of time, have a word with them during normal office hours when, you, when they look as though they are calm and, and organized and responsive to someone coming up to them and saying, can we have a chat about something? That's a far better way of handling it than at the moment they're having a meltdown or the moment they've come back from, from their safe space to chivvy them about it. Say, Ooh, check your time, check your time. We're in, the, we're in the third decade of the 21st century, which I keep saying to people, we are in the third decade of the 21st century. Let's stop clock watching people. Let's trust them. Let's build a relationship with them and you will get on much better with your staff if you're an employer. If you're, if you're the employee... You don't want to be badgered. You know you went you know you went to a safe space for ten or fifteen minutes. You'll make it up. You're a diligent employee. You'll make it up. Or if you can't make it up that day, when you come in the next day, say, I know I haven't made up my time from yesterday or the day before. I'll catch up with it tonight. Thanks for understanding. And that's it. It's all of the conversation you need to have. Managers need to be sitting there with his stopwatch and his clipboard. Please don't do that. If you're, an employment, if you're an employer and you have people who are sitting there with stopwatches and clipboards, micromanaging what people are doing, stop. I'm looking right at you now and I'm saying stop. That's not how to manage people in the 21st century. Please don't do it. There are other ways. You need to have leaders. Not, you want leaders who inspire people, not managers who are clock watching people. And if you're a minute late, I'm going to write you up. Stop it. Please stop it. I very rarely instruct people in my in my uh, my episodes of talking Asperger's with Andrew. But if you're doing that, please stop. If you want to know how to do better, please get in contact with me and I'll be able to, delighted to have a conversation with you. So that's very briefly the employment situation of the safe space. But there's more to it than that. Imagine you're a parent and your 12-year-old son or daughter has Asperger's syndrome or autism. They've had a really trying testing day at school. Teachers have been on at them. Their homework hasn't been good. Their grades haven't been good. They've got an assignment back that they've got a D or an E on. They're stressed. They are absolutely stressed right up to here. They have done everything they possibly can not to lash out at someone, a fellow pupil, a bully, a teacher. They had absolutely done everything they can to hold it together and get home. 
the problem can be that the parent can say, I've got you, you make sure you get your chores done by five o'clock tonight. That could be the trigger that causes that child to have a meltdown right there in your kitchen, in your living room, within two minutes of them walking in the door. It's not bad parenting. Your child has just done the most amazing thing by not having a meltdown at school, which would get them into trouble, could lead them into disciplinary matters at school, letters sent home from school about behavior and disruption in class and all of that myriad of things that happen. Your child has managed to get through school and not have a meltdown. And you say something innocent, perfectly normal, make sure you put your shoes on the shoe rack or don't don't hang your don't chuck your coat on the couch, hang it up in the hall on the hook. That could be all that it needs. That could be that insignificant to you minor react interaction with your child that could send that child into a meltdown because they've been hanging on all day they've now got out of their environment and they're back home they're back home in familiar ground their familiar territory and their bedroom is their sanctuary where they can be themselves where they don't have to interact with anyone where they know that dinner is going to be at six o'clock or mum will shout you when it's 10 minutes before dinner or whatever that is you their bedroom is their safe space it's their sanctuary it's the one place that they have where they can be themselves and they can relax. They can kick their shoes off. They can get out their school uniform and put their lounging trousers on or their sweatpants and a T-shirt. Whatever it is that they do so that they can be themselves in their bedroom, away from everything. That's their sanctuary. That's their safe space. Don't take that away from them. And if they're having, if they've had a bad day at school and they say, when mum says, you know, don't do that, don't do that. Mum, give me a minute. Give me five minutes. And then they rush up the stairs. Don't go chasing after them because they haven't put the bins out the minute they walked into from school. Don't chase after them because they haven't made you a cup of tea when they said they were going to and that's your normal routine. Let them be. Let that child run up the stairs, shut his door, her door, and get into their safety mode of being safe in their place, getting changed out of their school uniform. They may be fire up their computer. They may play, um, play games on their telephone. They may message their friends on their phones. Um, they may do their MRPG that they're on, and they need that fix of their MRPG for an hour because, or half an hour because they can unwind from the hullabaloo and the hurly-burly and the stress and the tension and all of those things that have gone on during the day at school over which they have very little control. Now they're back at home. They're in their safe space, their room, their sanctuary. I know I keep saying that, but it's really important to understand that that's what it is. Their room is their sanctuary, it's their safe space. It's where they can relax. It's where they don't have to pretend to be anything. It's where they can take off their mask. The mask that they've been wearing of being school kid, responsible school kid at school, the mask that they have when they're around other people. If it's a, if it's a, if you have a son, it could be the mask they have around around girls at school. The interaction when I was a when I was I was I was hopeless at interacting with girls when I was at school. Just so, too stressful. What do I say? How do I say it? What are they going to do? It was really really difficult. And likewise, if you've got a daughter. They might be having really trouble interacting with boys at school in normal everyday things that other people take for granted. Their sanctuary is their room where they can kick off their school uniforms and just be allowed to be. And if you have a routine where where if your child runs up, runs up the stairs, says, Not now, Mum, and you think, Oh, they're gonna they need time, they need time to relax and unwind. Maybe 15 minutes, bring him up a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. Knock on the door. This is the good one. Knock on the door and wait. If you get those two words that say, three words that says, not now, mum, or not now, dad, don't push it. Say, okay, I'll leave a cup of tea on the, on the floor outside the door. It's there if you want it. Don't worry. And then go downstairs and leave them alone. If they say, okay, mum, come in, then you can come in. 
and you can if there's a conversation that lets be led by the child led by the child it might be a mundane thing about nothing but they have time to reorganize themselves and refocus and calm down they may be able to say I had a really bad time in physics today or it was hellish at lunchtime we played around there with kids and it was too much noise and it was this and it was that and then if they if they volunteer that information the parent can have the conversation with them if they don't don't push it there will be a time later on in the day when they are calmer and you can have you can ask them how's their day been is there anything you want to talk about and do it as simple as that and if they say not now mum not now dad please don't push me on it well they probably won't say please don't push me on it they'll just say not now and they'll have that look that says please don't accept that as a please don't interact with me at the moment i can't cope with it they're not being rude. They're not being rude. They're not being disrespectful to you as a parent. They are at the brink of blowing up about something that happened at school. So you'd be really understanding that if they say, not now, mum, not now, dad, leave them to it. Honestly, trust me on this. It's really important that that interaction that you have with them, if they say not now, leave them alone. They'll come down when they're ready. Or if you've called them and it's dinner time in 10 minutes, they'll come down for dinner. And if they're quiet and don't want to say anything, don't push it. Don't push it. Maybe just say at the end of dinner, if they're going to ready and you know that they're ready to go back upstairs, just say, if you want to come down and talk about it, I'm still here. Come down when you're ready. That's okay. And that's it. Don't push it. Leave the door open for you to have the conversation with them when they are ready. Please accept what I'm saying is let the child lead that situation because it's really important for them because they can then keep calm and be controlled in what they're doing. Because as I said, and I keep saying, their room is their sanctuary. It's the one place, the one place that they have got where they can be themselves, calm down, keep relaxed, focus and work on their homework or reading or, playing, or talking to their friends online or whatever it is. Allow them that time to, to desensitize themselves from what's going on at school today. Because they, as I said earlier, they could have had a really tough time. They could have had a really tough time. And the last thing they want to be able to do or have to do is tell their parents about it when they're not ready to do so. So... As a parent, look for these triggers, look for these signals. And if you think, now's not the time to have a conversation about tidying the shoe rack up or emptying the bins or doing some chores or folding the washing or whatever it is, now's not the time to have that conversation. Then don't have it. Just make yourself available when they're ready. Because they are, what they're doing is they are helping you manage them. The way that they do these things with their interactions with you when they've had bad days and good days is they're giving you the signals, they're giving you the, the information as to how to manage them, how to interact with them that works best for them. And yes, I know there have to be rules, there have to be guidelines, there has to be parental responsibility in the child must know that there's a line that mustn't get crossed in certain areas. I'm not saying let the child have their way all of the time. What I'm saying is as a responsible parent recognize these signals that happen when they come in from school give them some leeway because you will work out you will work out how it works best for you because if you really have something that you absolutely have to speak to them about and, and you think they're going to run upstairs. Just say, I need to talk to you about something. Can you come down in half an hour? Give them the time to calm down from the school situation. If it's an absolutely urgent thing, say, I know you want to go upstairs and, and be yourself in your room, but I need to talk to you about something before dinner and before your dad comes in. It's important. Can you make time for me? Can we set a time in half an hour's time where we can have a cup of tea and a biscuit? That's the way to deal with that. So that you're still the parent, you're still 
being active in parenting, you're still, I'm not to say in control, but you're guiding the, the, the way that the relationship is and you're in charge of that because you're the parent, you're responsible. You want what's best for them. And that's the key thing. What's best for them isn't necessarily what's best for you at that moment. Timing is everything. It's everything when you have someone that you love who has Asperger's or autism. Timing is everything. Get the timing wrong, you get a meltdown. You get a shouting fit. You get crockery thrown across the room. You get all sorts of horrible things happening because the child has lost control and is unable to control themselves. You don't want that to happen. So timing and being aware of their triggers and this only comes from experience. This only comes from understanding your child. And yes, you're going to get it wrong. Yes, the child is going to be a brat from time to time. But there's a, I'm just going to say that there's a world of difference between a child having a tantrum because they can't get their own way and they want to go to their grands on Saturday and you're not letting them, they have a tantrum. There's a world of difference between a tantrum and a meltdown. A world of difference. The tantrum is voluntary. They can turn it on and off whenever they want. A meltdown is an uncontrollable response to trigger stimulus, which could be noise, a change, someone bullying them, or, uh, par parental heavy-handedness, bullying at school, all sorts of things, or a teacher having a go at them because they couldn't answer a question in science or in biology or in maths or whatever it was today or they didn't remember the date of the Battle of Waterloo in history and the teacher had a go at them about it and whereas to most neurotypical people that the teacher having a go at you is gone and, gone and forgotten and done and dusted within a minute for the child with Asperger's or autism it stays it lingers, it festers it eats away at them and it adds to the level of angst that is ramping up throughout the day at school. So a simple thing that you think, oh, yeah, forget it. I'll be, yeah, let it go. Doesn't happen with, with, with someone, excuse me, with someone with Asperger's. So if that someone is your child, they could have all of that gone on before they've come home from school. And they've thrown their bag in the hall and they've kicked off their shoes and sent them flying across the hall and they've ignored the dog and they've just gone running upstairs. Let them be. Honestly, please let them be. And say, I'll, I'll come up and see you in, in a wee while with a cup of tea. You may not get a response as they're hurtling up the stairs to their room. But do the, do the cup of tea trick in half an hour and see what you get. Because it will work. And so that what you're doing is you're building the relationship, understanding their triggers, and the child is understanding yours. So that you build this relationship that works for both of you. So that you understand triggers, you don't hit the triggers. You understand, the child understands the parental responsibility and that there has to be rules that, that govern how they behave. And that that's right and proper that you have those rules. But there needs to be the flexibility, understanding that sometimes when they come in from school, they are ready to blow up. And it's not your fault as the parent. And if they do blow up, it's not your fault as the parent. You've just been that last, that last little trigger in a place where they feel that they can be safe and don't have to have their mask on and try and fit in and comply with everyone else's rules and regulations. You could be just straw that broke the camel's back the tiny little tipping point boom allow them to have that time to gather themselves try the cup of tea trick the cup of coffee trick half an hour after they come in from school see what happens it might work it might well work but knock on the door first I know as a parent you think you shouldn't need to do that knock on the door for it because you're giving your child respect and you're respecting their position of them being in their safe space, their sanctuary, in their bedroom. So please do that. Knock. Hi, everything okay? I've made you a cup of tea. Do you want to chat now? 
Give me 10 minutes, mum. What do you need? That'll work. And at that point, if you've got important news or important information or a bit concerned about your behaviour last week at Grands, we need to talk about it, that's when you can have that conversation because they're in the right frame of mind to listen to you in a responsible, open way without the angst and anxiety of all that's gone on at school. That's the safe space. And that's the importance of a safe space for them, for your child, for your young adult, your teenager. And teenagers with Asperger's, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough being the teenager with Asperger's when you don't know you have Asperger's and everything around you is just a, 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 a chaos of, a melange of chaos and everything piling up on top of you and difficult to cope with so be understanding have your rules definitely have your rules but accept that sometimes you need to bend them because you recognize an attitude a behavior uh, a situation when they come in from school not now mum give me 10 minutes not now mum give them the give them the half an hour then do the cup of tea drink because you're accepting them having that situation. They're far more likely to come down after that half an hour or have the conversation with you with the cup of tea and then talk to you about what's gone on school today. And they'll be more able to talk rationally, sensibly, without the full hit of the emotion that they were at experiencing in those situations at school. They'll be able, they should be able to talk to you more calmly, more relaxed, and that will help them explain the situation. It will help you understand it without thinking, if I say the wrong thing, he's going to go boom, or she's going to go boom and have a meltdown because they've had their time to calm down and relax. Big topic, safe space, and it's one that's very close to my heart. It's it's one of my key techniques in my seven step program that I work with employers, and uh, it, it it always comes up as a wow, it's a great idea. How can we make it work? How can we how can we help that person at work? How can we support them and understand and allow them to be themselves, to calm down, to come back to work and be productive? Because that's what you want as an employer. As an employer, your job is to support your staff so that they can be as effective, as efficient, and as productive as they can be with the tools that they have available in the right environment and given the right support. That's your job as an employer. Grasp that and understand that, that your job is to support your staff to be their authentic selves so that they can be the best that they can be at their work. And tell them. Tell them you value what they've done. If they've done a particular project that's taken two weeks and they've delivered it to you on Friday at the right time and it's of the right quality and you're pleased with it, tell them. Say, that was great. I really, li really liked what you did with that report. Good conclusions. Good spark conclusions and recommendations. Keep it up. That's really good. That is good leadership. That's what we need. We need more of that in the workplace. That's part of understanding all of the aspects of someone who has Asperger's syndrome or autism in the workplace. And a key component is the safe space. One of the fundamental parts of a modern day business. And, and I know that some of you are small employers. You think, how can we do this? Let them go for a walk around the block. Let them go and sit in their car. But don't chivvy them about the time. They'll make it up. You can have that conversation with them when they're calm and relaxed about how you're going to make up the time, how they're going to deal with it. So it's acceptable to you and it's acceptable to them. You can do that. We can, you can do that together so that it's not you imposing another set of rules on someone who's uh, procedures, rules, which are good because they understand how they do their work. But some of those micromanaging things are not good for them. People with Asperger's and, and autism, they like rules. They like, they like procedures because 
it sets out how things will be done. They know the order of things are going to be done. What they don't need is the micromanaging rules of clock watching. And you were 12 minutes when you went to a toilet break today. How are you going to make up the time? Oh, please give me a break. You know, as I said 10 minutes ago, we are in the third decade of the 21st century. We're not in the 60s or 70s. We're not even in the 80s or the 90s now. The 1980s started 42 and a half years ago. Let's remember that. And let's not do some of those horrible practices that we did in employment in the 1980s. Let's be better than that. We can do better. We should do better. We must do better. Support and understand your staff. Have a safe space. It will work. If you want it to work, it will work. You're supporting your staff in the best way so that they can be as productive as they can be. That's about all I wanted to cover on the safe space today. It's a topic that I could, as you could probably tell, I could talk about for quite a long time because I'm very passionate about it because it is something that can be implemented at virtually no cost, no effort, virtually no effort. Once it's set up and it's running, it's done. Just make sure that it's clean, it's tidy, it's not too light, it's not too much noise, it's not abused by people who don't need to be there or are overstepping the mark. You work that out as, as, as you go through it. And the way that you'll find out that it works is when you're having effective, productive people with Asperger's syndrome and autism working well in the teams, doing good work. That's when you say, I've noticed you go to the safe space a couple of times, but you've been great when you've been back and the, your work's been fantastic. That's all you need to say. Don't interrogate them as to why they've gone. If there's an issue with why they've gone, that someone or a certain situation has happened, allow them to come to you and say, actually, yeah, the last three times I've gone, it's because this happened. And it's the same thing. And that's something that as a manager, as a leader, you then need to look into and see if there's something that needs resolution that with, with yourselves or with your teams or with other management in different departments of the business that you're working in or whatever the situation is. That's when you need to step up and investigate and see if there's a solution so that that person doesn't keep having to go because something is happening and it's the same thing that's happening. Just be aware that if you're the manager, there's something that's happening could be you making changes, changing the reports or changing the output or micromanaging, or it could be, be prepared for them to tell you that it's you and what you have done that is impacting on them and have them having to go to their safe space. Be responsible at manager and understand, be a responsible leader and understand that the trigger for them needing to go to the safe space could be you. If that's the case, investigate it. What is it that you're doing that is causing this to happen? Because although you have one person, let's just suppose you have one person with Asperger's syndrome in your team, that thing that you do that causes them to go to their safe space might be impacting everyone else in your teams, but they are able to adapt to it better than the person with Asperger's syndrome. They might not like it. They might grumble and groan about it over the around the water cooler and when they're having their cup of tea, but they can cope with and manage it better than someone who has Asperger's syndrome. So the person with Asperger's might just be the, the one thing they're saying. It's a manager problem. Be prepared to accept that and deal with it and resolve the situation, resolve the problem. And if we're talking about the other situation of your child with Asperger's syndrome or autism at home, be aware that their bedroom is their sanctuary, it's their safe space. They need to be there to calm down, particularly when they come in from work. Or they may come in from work, they may grab a cup of tea and they may like to sit and watch a quiz show on the television for half an hour. That could be their way of unwinding and, and, and calming down and laughing at, at some of the horrendous answers that people make on TV quiz shows, which is another topic altogether. And that might be their way of unwinding. Allow them to have that moment. Yes, you might not like the quiz show that they're watching and you can hear it in the background when you're in the kitchen or when you're doing something else in the house. But them sitting watching that TV quiz show 
might be the thing that is calming them down, changing their outlook, changing their mood, refocusing their attention from school mode to relaxed home mode. And they might need that half an hour, that 45 minutes, watching terrible players on television quiz shows get things wrong. Because that's funny. I laugh at it. I used to do television quiz shows. I was on them a couple of times. So they are fun things to do. And that might be that child's way of unwinding from being at school. They might be running up the stairs and don't want you to come near them for half an hour and say, not now, mum. In which case, give them the time, do the cup of tea trick, see what happens. But then their way of winding down might be going to sit and watch trashy television for half an hour. Allow them to do it. It'll help them. It'll help them refocus, change their mindset from what has gone on at school. So that is me coming to the end of today's Talking Asperger's with Andrew. And if you are an employer and you are interested in managing Asperger's syndrome at work and you want to know more about my seven steps program or any other techniques that, uh, that I can help you with to implement at work to get better managing Asperger's syndrome and your Asperger's employees, then please feel free to get in touch. You can get in touch with me at andrew at aspergersmatters.com or via the contact page on my website, which is aspergersmatters.com. Thank you for your time. It's been uh, it's been here. And if you're watching on the replay and you've got any questions, then please feel free to get in touch with me through those, through those channels. And keep a lookout on Friday for next week's conversation. Um, topic although i do know what next week's topic is i had an inspired moment earlier today next week's topic is fitting in how people with asperger's struggle to fit in so that's what it's going to be and it's how you can help them and some of the things that we talked about today about safe space are covered in that but it's going to broaden it out into fitting in in general so if you want to know more about that then uh, please look up my uh, LinkedIn event post on Friday afternoon but until then thank you for your time take care and I'll see you next week